Hey guys, what's up? I'm Erin and welcome back to the channel. Likely we all have some ways in which we waste money. After all, it's pretty darn hard to be perfect. Although some of us try. But there are some fairly common and rather silly ways in which most of us waste money. But being that we trade our actual life hours in order to get a paycheck probably should mean that we should waste as few dollars as possible because wasted dollars translates into wasted life hours and no one wants that. Now, of course, not every single category is going to apply to every single person, but it's likely that one or two of the categories apply to you and finding out where you're spending needlessly can help you course correct and maybe dedicate those dollars to something that's a little bit more meaningful to you. Off the top of your head, what are some areas in which perhaps you waste some dollars? With that said, let's dive right in to some of the most common ways that people waste money. Number one, subscriptions you don't use. As of 2021, it's reported that the typical American has nine subscriptions across all entertainment platforms. Think music, video, gaming, nine. That's a lot. But that doesn't factor in all subscriptions. That's literally just entertainment. Then you have to think about subscriptions outside of the realm of entertainment. For example, gym memberships. And it's reported that 53% of people who have gym memberships don't even go to the gym, but they keep their membership going. In total, Americans are spending an average of $273 per month on subscriptions. That works out to be over $3,000 a year. Now, subscriptions aren't a bad thing. If you have a gym membership and you actually go to the gym, great, that's a super healthy habit. But if you don't go, don't just keep that subscription open in the hopes that one day you will form that healthy habit. And if you're one of those households that has multiple entertainment subscriptions, maybe cut back. Maybe for six months, you decide that you're gonna have Netflix and Hulu, then cancel those. After six months, you can switch on over to Disney Plus and Amazon Prime. You can kind of rotate through them, but you don't need them all at once. Are you really gonna watch all of them at the same time? Probably not. You probably don't have that much time on your hands. After all, wasn't the whole point of getting streaming services to cut back on our cable bill? Once you add three or four or five subscriptions, you're back at the price of cable anyway. Nowadays, it seems like companies offer subscriptions for everything. News outlets offer them for premium articles. There's learning boxes for kids, toys for dogs, clothing, food, you name it, there's probably a subscription for it. There's nothing inherently wrong with any subscription, but if you don't use it, you don't need it. After all, how many toys does your dog really need? At the end of the day, take a look at the subscriptions you have. If you have ones that you don't need or ones you aren't using, cancel them. It's reported that a third of Americans actually have subscriptions that they don't even know that they have and they're paying for them. Don't let that be you. Number two, out of network doctors. I have worked in the dental field for 20 years at this point, And to this day, I do not understand why people go to out of network doctors, yet I see it every single day. Going to an in-network insurance company can save you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Now, I'm not talking to those people who have this totally random, obscure insurance company where it can be nearly impossible to find an in-network doctor for. What I'm talking about are those people who have a fairly common insurance, which is a vast majority of those who have insurance. They have a wide variety of doctors to choose from. I exclusively go to in-network providers. Anytime I make an appointment with a medical doctor, a dentist, an eye doctor, that's my first question. And as a side note, the question I ask verbatim is, are you an in-network provider with my insurance? I do not say, do you accept my insurance? Because accepting an insurance is not the same thing as being an in-network provider, but some providers will act a little shady and pretend that it is. And if you can't tell, this irks me. If they're an out-of-network provider, they can accept your insurance as long as it has out-of-network benefits, but that means they are in no way contractually obligated to reduce to your insurance's fee schedule, meaning it will leave you with a greater copay. 
and also the fees paid by the insurance companies to both in and out of network providers is often vastly different. So even if your copay isn't larger, if you go exclusively to out of network doctors, you can actually use up your annual insurance benefits more quickly. Now, of course, I want you to have excellent medical care, but chances are you can find a highly rated provider who accepts your insurance. Now, I actually want to throw some numbers out there that actually compare in and out of network costs. And I'm going to use dental because it's the field I know. When it comes to preventative care, like your routine checkups, if you see an in-network doctor, you'd likely have $0 as a copay. If you go to an out-of-network doctor, it can be $100 plus. If you were to need something like a filling, if you go to an in-network doctor, your copay would be somewhere like $20 to $50. At an out-of-network doctor, it would be anywhere from $100 to $300, maybe even $400. For an in-network doctor, if you were to need something major like a crown, your out-of-pocket cost would be about $400. With an out-of-network provider, your out-of-pocket cost would actually be $1,000 or so. So seeing an in-network provider matters. Number three, big homes. The average home bought today is about 2,700 square feet. If you go back to the 1970s, the average home size was about 1,500 square feet. But family size hasn't increased. In fact, it's actually on the decline. Not dramatically, but it's declining nonetheless. Now, we actually live in townhome style condos. The layouts for all of them are 100% identical. My neighbors on the other side of the wall are absolutely amazing, but we are vastly different. My neighbors are in their early 70s and have recently retired and are downsizing from a 5,000 square foot home. That's huge. They're constantly going around saying, I can't believe how small these places are. However, on the flip side, you have my husband and I, who have exclusively lived in studio and one bedroom apartments prior to buying this place. So we walk around saying, I can't believe how big it is. Perspective matters. The bigger the home you buy, the more stuff you are going to buy to fill it. Because if you have a spare bedroom, you're gonna fill that room with something. Maybe it becomes a guest room or an office or a game room or something else, some other kind of room that appeals to you. Quite frankly, it'd be a little bit strange if you just left that room sitting completely empty, but it's gonna cost you something to fill it. If you have a spare dining room, it may not get used except for special occasions. Or if you have an extra living room, maybe that's just for the kids or maybe it doesn't get used at all. They've actually done studies on this and found that the vast majority of people only use a small percentage of their home. You probably use the kitchen, the living room, your bedroom, a bathroom, and that's pretty much it. But we tend to live in a more is more society where people tend to buy homes that are bigger than they need. And it's not just that these homes that are bigger have higher upfront costs and cost more to furnish, they have higher ongoing costs. Think utilities, maintenance, and taxes. Those costs are higher. So too are the repair costs. And if you think about it, your commute cost is probably higher as well if you live in a bigger home because bigger homes tend to be built further away from the cities. Cities don't really allow for those homes that have those larger footprints. So you probably have a longer commute into work. Number four, storage units. And when we run out of space in our homes, we turn to storage units. And make no mistake about it, the storage unit business is huge. It's $40 billion a year. And that's a 50% increase from 2010. When I hear that, I immediately think, great business opportunity. But I also think, what in the world are people doing? You're literally buying so much stuff that you have to rent a box in which to keep it because it does not fit in your home. At that point, you've bought so much stuff that your house is full that you literally have to rent space to keep this extra stuff. You keep buying things. That sounds nuts to me, especially when you consider that 65% of self-storage renters have a garage at their home. 47% have an attic and 33% have a basement. So all of these areas are full plus a storage unit? Seriously, that's nutso. 
A better plan would be to stop buying stuff, declutter, have a garage sale, post it on Facebook Marketplace, make some spare change while you're at it. Because a good general rule in life is if it doesn't fit in your home, don't buy it. There's no need to rent a box to simply store stuff. Number five, designer labels or trendy clothing. I think trendy clothes are an absolute waste. How long does a trend last? A couple months? What do you do when the trend is over? Do you just leave those clothes sitting in your closet hoping that trend will come around again? Or do you throw it out? That seems wasteful. If you throw it out, you probably need to buy something to replace it, which again, costs more money. A better plan would be to buy a timeless wardrobe. For a classy gal like myself, tends to be jeans and a t-shirt. They're basic, but I know they're always going to work. Seriously, I have clothes that I've worn for 10 years straight and they look great, but they're all very basic. It just seems like nowadays manufacturers are pushing you to buy new clothes every single month, but we don't have 12 seasons in a year. That's absolutely unnecessary. You can't even use that many clothes. But I have to admit, when I was younger, I totally fell for this. I was buying clothes all the time. I was a borderline clothing addict, and to this day, I still have too many. But in 2020, I vowed that I was not going to buy a single article of clothing for an entire year. And I kept that vow to myself, and I was super proud. But it just seems like the marketing that is coming from these companies is getting more and more aggressive, pushing people to buy more and more clothing. We do not need that much. And designer labels, they don't mean much. Buy things that are quality, buy things that last, but don't buy it simply because there's a designer label on it. I actually worked for a boss for a vast number of years where every Christmas he would give the girls a designer purse. FYI, I am not the girl for this. I don't find them to be practical, so I don't use them. I ended up being a girl who has a collection of designer purses that she's never used. My favorite purse is one that I got off Amazon. It's crossbody, it's perfect size. I loved that purse. I used it so much to the point where a wire snapped out of it and started cutting my skin. I put some electrical tape on it, hoping that it would make it last. It didn't, the wire still snapped out and continuously was cutting my skin. It got to the point where I was still holding on to this purse because it was so perfect in every single way. I didn't want to replace it, that my husband threatened to actually destroy this purse or throw it away while I was sleeping. First of all, rude. Second of all, it's slash resistant, so good luck destroying it. I did eventually buy a new purse, but I delayed the purchase so long that we actually got in an argument about it. So welcome to marriage. But there's no way I was gonna use one of those designer purses. They aren't practical for everyday life. With designer labels, nine times out of 10, you are just paying for the name. Just go for quality, forget the designers. Number six, jewelry, especially diamonds. For the most part, I think the vast majority of jewelry is overhyped, overpriced, and underworn. You cannot think of jewelry, especially diamonds, as an investment. Their value quickly drops right after you purchase it. It's highly unlikely that if you were to try to sell some jewelry, you'd get a price anywhere near what you actually paid. And I hesitate to say this one, but I think engagement rings are overrated. Now, I do have a caveat to this. I think this is an incredibly personal decision and it's up to you and your significant other. If you guys want a real engagement ring, go for it. But I think in society, we're often told that there is only one option, a real diamond engagement ring. And that's bogus. That is just marketing. Granted, I do have to be honest, I do have a real diamond ring. It's small, it's nothing crazy, and I do love my ring. But I also didn't know that there was a different option. Neither did my husband. It wasn't until after we were married that I found out about cubic zirconia. And I started to think that that would have been a better option for us. We were both young, still getting started in our careers. Granted, he did buy a ring that he could afford, but many people don't. Many people go into debt for jewelry or they save up several months of a salary. And I think that's just silly. A fake diamond does not mean fake love. Love. I really do think that cubic zirconias should be considered as an option. And based on the amount that I actually wear my ring, I can guarantee you that my husband would never buy me a piece of jewelry again. Number seven, upgrading to the new version. 
Apple comes out with a new phone almost every single year. PlayStation comes out with new gaming systems on the regular. There are new cars on the lot every single year. But just because it's available does not mean that you have to upgrade to the latest version. If your phone is still working great and does absolutely everything you need it to do, continue using it for a couple years. You don't need to upgrade to the latest one that has a camera that is one hundredth of a percent better chances are you're just taking pictures of your dog anyway. The average person buys a new car every four to six years. That's crazy, because cars nowadays are built to last 100 or even 200,000 miles. The typical and most popular car loan term is actually 72 months. That's six years. So that means that people are literally just paying off their car and then turning around and going out and buying a brand new one. The second most popular loan term for a car, 84 months. That's seven years. So that means that people are actually buying a new car before their old one is even paid off. And yes, if your car is seven years old, I'm sure you consider it old, but the odds are it has a great deal of life left in it. Continue driving your vehicle for longer. Drive it until it's done and doesn't want to be driven anymore. Get your money's worth, or at least drive it for longer than four to six years. Most things that we buy have a longer life than we give them credit for. You don't have to wait until they totally break down before you replace them, but you can use them a bit longer than you otherwise would have to make your money go a little bit further. Number eight is food. There's no doubt about it. As Americans, we typically waste food. It's reported that 94% of Americans throw out food on a regular basis. The average American throws out 250 pounds worth of food every single year. And I can tell you that I am solidly in this 94%. I am constantly trying to get better at it, but inevitably I end up throwing out food that has gone bad before I had the chance to eat it. This translates into one problem. We're buying too much at the grocery store, which means we're wasting money. And there's no mistaking it that going out to eat or ordering takeout is very common in our culture. As a matter of fact, 56% of people eat at a restaurant or get takeout two to three times per week. 10% do this four to six times per week. 6% say they eat out every single day. For those keeping score at home, that is 72%. So a vast majority of people are eating out on a regular basis. And if you love eating out, great, but just know that it comes at a cost. The average price of a restaurant meal is $20.37 per serving. The average price of a home-cooked meal is $4.31 per serving. My husband and I love to cook, and most of the time we will splurge for those higher quality foods like grass-fed and organic meats, and we'll do high quality produce. Yes, it costs more, but we know that even if it costs more at the grocery store, it still costs less than eating out, and it's also healthier. If you were to reduce the number of times you ate out in a restaurant to maybe once per week, you could literally save yourself thousands of dollars throughout the course of a year. And even better, on top of that, we could all become more diligent shoppers. We could buy less at any given trip. That way we could eat our food before it has a chance to expire. Well, there we go. Those are the most common ways that I find that people tend to waste money. Are there any that you would add to the list? Let me know in the comments down below. If you got anything at all out of this video, please give it a like. If you're new here, please consider subscribing or consider sharing as it really does help the channel. I post new videos every single week, so I'll see you soon, guys. Have a good one. Bye.